It is June the 19th, 2021, and you're watching The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. And we're back with another episode. It is um, three of us today. Adrian, hello. Jeremiah, hello. 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 <coughs> Everyone okay? Everyone doing fine? We are good. Yeah. I've, re I've yeah. reached melting temperature here in Germany. It's been like 30, mid 30s today. So That's hot. <sighs> but hey, well, powering through. By the way, did you hear that Death Valley came within five degrees of the record of the hottest place on Earth ever what? last week? Oh, is Death Valley not got that record already <clears throat> No, I, I think not. I think uh, somewhere in the in North Africa uh, was that record, or Australia, uh, okay. I forget. But um, amazingly hot, like one twenty-seven something. I was going to say it must be right up there. I mean, I'm, I've, I remember being in Death Valley. It was it was one hundred and twenty odd, which is about I think it's about fifty Celsius. It was hot, hot, hot. I was yeah. I was in uh, Ethiopia in Dalol, which is the like hottest ever inhabited place where people used to live and work and dig sulfur out of the ground. So, um, but they don't do this anymore because no one wants to do that. So, yeah, I shot uh, a, a part of a movie in Death Valley. We were there for about three weeks, um, cool. and uh, but we did it in the in the spring. Um, Late winter. It was beautiful. Really, really lovely. Uh, you don't want to be driving across Death Valley in your little electric car. <laughs> no, they do. So they, I remember it was a long, long time, 20 years or so ago, I drove across Death Valley and uh, you, know, the, the, what was, you have to turn the air conditioning off. Like, yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> the car would uh, overheat, yeah. Because mm. the car would overheat and then you'd be stopped and then you'd be stuck in the middle and of Death Valley. And there's nothing yeah. around. No, not for, oh, no. It's anyway, I, I anyway. think... I think so, that kind of leads us into what we want to talk about today. Um, that's right. Adrian, you suggested getting back out there. What um, What's that about? Well, you know, uh, you know for, well, I think I'm going to start with a caveat, right? Because I want this to be a really positive conversation, but I recognize that that not everybody has the freedom of movement that they like. So, um, but the... The, the reality for me and maybe for some others as well is that things are starting to open up a bit and uh, I went on a photo walk a few days ago uh, which was both amazing and slightly scary and you know some <laughs> things were the same and some things were different and you know Chris I know you've got workshops coming up Jeremiah you've got productions in the pipeline and you know I, it just sort of be a nice opportunity to have a, a positive conversation and 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 share I don't know it's a sort of random of emotions about being out and going out and how hard it can be but also how good it feels to get out there you know that sort of thing yeah i think that's the, you know the, the, it's admirable because you know we we are faced with the uh the kind of new fogo fear of going out uh which many people have <laughs> interesting <laughs> didn't know that instead term. of F fogo fogo is the new fomo isn't it that, yes. that is exactly right it's like yeah i'm okay with missing out i'm not so sure about going out uh, <laughs> the the i guess the the overall issue is uh, under what conditions is it financial uh weighing the risk uh is the anxiety of being out there balanced uh, how does that affect our creativity and our abilities to go further off the path? And in some ways, the more off the path you go, the safer it is because the less people will be around. I guess it's really just the balance. I think the way to do it is just to dip a toe in the water and start to do it slowly until you acclimatize and weigh the risk. Of yeah. course, it's very different when we're talking about getting on a crowded uh, subway train, um, a major airport, um, or a rave. <laughs> so <laughs> there are different levels here. There are different levels. Yeah. No, I, I, I know. I just, just have a, I just have a positive story to share. Right. So Please. a few days ago, I went out on a photo walk, my first photo walk since I think February, 2020, uh, because, you know, be well, because we all know why, because so the, uh, you know, the, I, I went to Oxford, right, city in the middle of England, 
Uh, it was a gloriously hot, sunny day and met up with uh, actually, for me, the largest group of people I've seen in a while. Um, yeah, the, the, the rule here in England at the moment is that you're allowed to meet with up to 30 people outdoors. Uh, we didn't have 30 people. We had about 25. Um, but we, we met up uh, in the centre of Oxford and you know, did a photo walk of you know, some of the, around some of the colleges, some of the fields, rivers, bridges, that sort of thing. Um, and generally just you know socialized and i saw some friends i hadn't seen for yeah, 18 months or so uh you know and i you know met some people i'd never met before and you know the town it's oxford a city no oxford's a city i think isn't it um it was it was definitely there were lots of people out but it wasn't as crowded as it should be because all the people all the locals were out but there were no tourists so you know the t- tourism isn't a thing here at the moment and uh you know i i I felt it was great. It was like reassuring. And, you know, we were out most of the day and I remember driving home uh, afterwards and I just felt like a real buzz. You know, it was a real positive experience to go out and it was really like restorative. It, it was the word. And mm. I don't know. I, I, don't, I, I can't think of the last time I had occasion to use the word restorative, but that was the word that sprung into my head as I was driving home the other day. <laughs> and uh, it was a fantastic thing. And yet yeah, some things were different. Right. So we weren't, you know, we, we, we weren't licking each other's cameras as you do when you have a photo <laughs> walk meet up. As yeah, you and, do. And, yes. <laughs> Um, and, and you know, there's there, there's that classic thing, at least in a, on a British photo walk, where everybody puts their cameras on the table, and you have to take the photo of all the cameras, especially if they're film phot- photographers, uh, as a lot of these were uh, that I was meeting up with. And uh, you know, so you've got all of these I- interesting and and sometimes rare and sometimes valuable cameras, you know, uh, and you have to d- do that sort of thing. So there's a few things were different, you know, and everybody had their masks. But I have to say. Everybody was good as gold. Everybody was respectful uh, of each other and each other's personal space. Everybody was respectful of the rules that are currently in force in England at the moment. Um, and, you know, overall, it was a really positive thing. And I, ju- I just wanted to sh- share that and just say, you know, we, we, we have lots and lots of reasons to talk about doom and gloom at the moment. And I, I just enjoyed being out there. And I'm looking forward to getting it, getting out there again, doing more. <laughs> It's it's easy to I mean I mean, a photo walk would kind of be my first step towards something like like coming back together because it's it's generally outside so you yep. you're not in a in a closed room together aerosols and stuff so you can you can easier keep your distance um, the the next level up for me is what I have coming up which is in about three weeks from now is a workshop which uh, is our Abbey workshop which we've been doing for I don't even know 15 years now every year in southern Germany in an old abbey with like 30 people and an entire full week of photo workshop so um, pretty interesting like project work between people and so on and those used to be these little project groups like three each and uh, and then they would they would work on a project for the entire week with our um, guidance and help and and encouragement and whatever, and then at the end of the week, we do like a real presentation in front of an audience, and uh, and and um, apparently, it, well, it 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 should be possible to do it again this year in a reduced fashion. So we have um, the 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 venue. Let me put this way: the venue, the Abbey, is a is a is a school type of organization, but they are specialized on groups being there for like an entire week. So they have. A, you stay there in the house. It's an old abbey, so you stay in the old uh, uh, nun cells, pretty much, um, <laughs> which are now nice little hotel type rooms. So they have a hotel business going on there. Then you eat there, which uh, three meals a day. So they have a restaurant type business, and then the school. So they are the, their biggest problem was they are under three different sets of rules because if the schools have to close, um, they can't do anything. If the restaurants have to close, they have a hard time. Uh, catering if the hotels have to close they uh, they can't do any week long workshops there because then all the other hotels around would also be closed so it was really kind of everything is coming together the 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 the, the seven day incidents here which is kind of our key number here in germany is low enough so um at this point we don't see any issues uh, but we have reduced the size of the group to half of it and we have also given out um that it's mandatory to be either vaccinated or 
you have have to have uh, have had COVID and be healthy again and have antibodies this way, or um, well, that, that's pretty much the two um, the two conditions under which we are going to hold this. And um, yeah, smaller group, a bit of a different setup, not not as close in terms of the group work for sure, but um, we can certainly work around this. And the the good thing about this is. Our community is a pretty tight-knit group, so the people who have signed up um, are—I know them. So pretty much every one of the, of those I know from previous workshops. So um, this is going to be a very, let's say, almost like a bit of a family reunion kind of thing. Um, yeah, my, the, the, some of the people that I met up with at the weekend, it was it was like meeting, you know, you know good friends I've known for years, you know, so it's a bit, a bit, bit of a similar thing, I think. So are, are you excited? I'm I'm uh, cautiously excited. Let's put it this way. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, good. I'm really looking forward to starting things back up. But again, as you said earlier, or as Jeremiah said, it's dipping the toe in the water. It is... Um, yeah getting that feel back for how this is going to work. Um, we still have plenty of time this year to do more workshops here in the Viewfinder Villa. So usually do like smaller uh, type workshops here with a smaller group. That in theory should be possible. So we'll have to, of course, see how things develop. Um, and then after that, the next step up would be to do another photo tour, which... Hmm. This point, I have no good India. <laughs> I have no good answers um, because I've received questions mm. from people saying, "When are you starting up the travel business again?" Yeah, and um, some of those preparations for one of these bigger tours is like a year ahead of time or longer. Um, sure. There's no way of knowing. What's there's financial risk involved, and it's not it's not small risk because you you have deposits, you have to pay a local organizer because they need to book hotels and transportation things. Um, so mm -hmm. at this point, and the rules right now, I mean, let's face it, we're still not through this whole thing. So no, um, no, no, there's, no. there's uh, things change in different countries. So wh wherever you want to go, um, it could still quickly change. And so we are, yeah, I'm, I'm not starting up the travel business just yet. But at least the first workshop in three weeks, that's a good start, a good uh, dipping my toe Yeah, it's, it's great that that can be done. Now, it, it is, you know, and I, I'm sure that all of the participants in the workshop, and hopefully you will, you as well, that you'll find it as a, as a very positive experience. And, oh, I, I know yeah. it will be a very positive thing. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, I, I have to say, just yeah, you know, sort of, yeah, you know, for reflecting on my own experience, you know, it it was overwhelmingly positive. Yeah, you know, which is a fantastic thing. I mean, there were some things that were different, as I say. You know, it's it's yeah. You know, the first thing you want to do, of course, is is go and shake hands with everybody. <laughs> it's like, and then we we found ourselves quite often doing a, a little dance because at the moment the status in in England is that it's actually okay you you are allowed to shake hands with people but the government advises you to be cautious, um and so you know the, there's like well, okay well do we do we shake hands do we fist bump do we do elbows you know or or, or what is it that that you do so so there was a a small amount of of, of awkwardness but but good natured awkwardness you know it it, it wasn't it wasn't a, a, a terrible thing. Um, there's a thing, so there's a few few things like that where uh, were different, um, but but overwhelmingly it it was a positive thing. So I, I wish you well, Chris, with with your workshop. I'm sure it's going to be a great thing. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's it's going to be the right thing. So so um, I think Jeremiah, you're next up because um, the, uh, the, the risk that I'm taking with these workshops right now that's pretty manageable in terms of its size. But yeah. when you when you do like a, a, a prepare a production for television or something that. I think that involves more people, more more salaries, more whatever. So um, a very, it's a it's a very significant step. Um, you know, you start with the you know with with dipping your toe, and um, on the personal level, creatively um, in my studio, um, I've gotten uh, adjusted and actually embraced uh, the creative experience I have both as a. Uh, sort of making uh, art or 
you know, in using my art practice to, to engage. Um, also in terms of writing, there's no issues there. Um, socializing is a, is another experience as you probably know from some of my posts, I still do my daily walks and, and around the canals or the beach, um, and see different things every day. So it, that, that's a, a wonderful personal photo walk. And sometimes I will do it with a single friend who I know has been vaxxed. We've begun the process here at home of having uh, two or three, even four people to the house outside, um, dining outside, all of whom have been vaccinated. Um, and that is, uh, as Adrian describes, it's it, there is a kind of wonderful feeling of like, wow, these people who I've just seen on Zoom or with email or on the phone are now, you know, we've, we've been able to hug and we've been able to embrace and, and we're very sure of our own kind of safety and we're still outside and don't do anything kind of crazy. In other words, nobody's blowing out a birthday cake. <laughs> serving it that's going to be over that did that did happen actually i have to say but it was purely with, purely within my family but it was there was one of the children in in our extended family ha had a birthday cake and, and blew out the candles and we're like oh can we all eat it now or not yeah, exactly <laughs> well i think they, when well, they, look, when... they didn't they didn't sneeze it out so that's probably no they no. didn't sneeze it out no, no. when you kind of move uh, expanded out in the la area we are very 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 happily the kind of lowest rate in the entire United States. So, so the, the, and where I live in LA on the West side is particularly progressive and liberal and all of that. So even within the community of a blue state uh, and a kind of blue Southern California, we are pretty uh, mask oriented. And even now when we go for walks, people are with masks or they socially distance. And if not, Without the mask, they're generally older. You know they've been vaccinated. And most people, I think 70% over 60, have been vaccinated here. So uh, walking outside, all of that socializing and, and, and kind of adhering to that. And then you kind of see our governor going on camera and going, we're open. And last week, we lifted the mask mandate. So it's now up to the individual uh, companies or retail organizations, you know, still we're, you know, we're low. But when the governor goes on, goes, we're open for business and let's bring the tourists back. Disneyland is open. And you realize where these tourists are coming from. Well, they're coming from Germany. They're coming from England. They're coming from China. They're coming from India. They're coming from Mexico. They are coming from everywhere. That's a problem. And that doesn't make me feel very positive about going out. I understand he's doing it because the economy needs to sustain. And we've managed to get through the pandemic in this state with a surplus. But it is extraordinarily daunting. There is a huge upswing in homelessness, which I'm sure is in your countries as well. Uh, but I've we seen see the pictures it, from LA, yeah. It's bad. Uh, it's very, very bad. And in Venice in particular, not in the pocket where we live, but near the beach, it's it's become a real, real issue. Um, and how to deal with that in a kind of anti-socialist <laughs> environment where Americans are like the individual. You have the freedom to starve to death and get sick and die on the sidewalk. That's your freedom. Um, so there's that. Um, so one has to balance the social with the personal and the kind of and, and fun. But in production, well, that's a whole other uh, thing. Um, productions have been pretty good at following mandates. They're very, very expensive. Th that's it. So factoring in the cost of managing um, a COVID uh, process is extremely difficult and expensive. Um, the other thing is, will it be constitutionally correct to ask people to get vaccinated before they can be employed? Well, we're not at that point, but, but we're going to get there. And I know for myself, uh, as I prepare and start to hire crew for the fall, 
I want people vaccinated. Um, and uh, is that going to be a problem? I don't know. Uh, the location is going to be on Vancouver Island for, for one of these. And even crossing the borders now is impossible without quarantining at a hotel at the airport. So that's the worst place I think anybody afraid of COVID needs to be in an elevator strewn COVID with bad food and, you know. So there are real challenges on the creative side. It's it's still uh, Zoom, it's still virtual, and that seems to be as, it's effective, but is not as fun. So we are both very free to kind of move around the <laughs> our civilization. And yet um, you look ahead and you see the dangers that lurk. And then unless this is, for me, a global um, arresting of this, uh, this, is, this fire is not going to go out. And uh, I think there's an opportunity for us to get overconfident. That's what I kind of oh, That's a very good way of putting it, yeah. I think, I think you're right. I mean, you know, if I think about the situation here in England, uh, we have what is, is known as the is variant D. I don't know if it, that's a global yeah. term. The Delta, um, the, the Delta, we call the, it. The Delta. The, the Delta. Yeah. And it's starting yeah. to spread here, too. Um, which is, uh, the, there are pockets where it's spreading very, very quickly. Um, it's... Uh, it, it, because because of where it's come from originally, I, as I understand it, originally identified in India, um, it's uh, it, it's a uh, it, it's in communities. So so it, there's not always as much integration of communities as we'd like in this country. Um, there, there's often in some in some places quite a lot of segregation of communities. So it's some of the Asian communities that are segregated are suffering terribly. Uh, whereas mm -hmm. you know a mile down the road, uh, uh, non-Asian people are, are, are not suffering at all. So it, it's a hardship there. And they've uh, everything was supposed to be opening up in about three days here in England. Um, uh, and all, all, all constraints on social movement were going to be lifted. Um, but that's been postponed now for another four mm. weeks while whilst we get more people vaccinated and uh, get yeah get control of this delta variant um the the good news is that is that um, anybody in England over the age of 18 and I think I think that might be the whole of the UK but I can't I can only speak knowledgeably for England um anybody over the age of 18 in England is now it can now get a vaccine so they can just go online yeah. book a vaccine pitch up and get it here over 12 and is it 12 problem, cool. of course okay. in the u.s is that uh, we ha we now have a surplus of vaccines we have vaccines we've done 300 million um they have more than they need it's proven to be very very good against even the variant two vaxes and yet you have you know 45 percent of the country is like it's my freedom not to get back. You know, it's become political. And that is the moronic uh, cultural mm. environment we, we live in where science has become political. Going, going yeah. back well, to Well, another thing that we've done here in England in the last week is host the G7 summit, of course, which <laughs> all our national leaders were present at. Um, and, uh, you know, there were, there were commitments made there for many hundreds of millions of, of doses. Yes, um, that's true. Not, worldwide, yeah. not, not sufficient for... For, for the population of the planet, of course, because, you know, if you, I don't know, mental arithmetic suggests we'd need about 15 billion doses if we were going to if we were going to vaccinate everybody. But, um, I have, you know, I, I have a, I have another production related story that I heard about. Oh, well, it must okay. be late in last year. Um let me let me try to remember. Yeah, it was it was something related to the BattleBots uh, franchise, and they um, they produced an entire season last year uh, under a pretty strict regime, where they um, ended up gathering everyone, the builders, the team, the production team, the audience, everyone in a warehouse. They shot everything in that warehouse, and they had everyone live on the premises, so they had like <laughs> campers and stuff sure. there. So mm -hmm. so everyone was, was quarantined first, and then they all stayed there together for a week, and they shot an, the entire season in that one week. So they really crammed in whatever they could. And what they did, and that was really early case of really understanding how this th stuff spreads, is um, they they set it up in a way that they 
um, pumped air in from the sides constantly, so it would create sure. an upwards draft that went out over over out out through the roof pretty much so whenever someone breathed out that air would just go up and disappear so um they they did this they had not a single case not a single transmission nothing um so it can be done yeah. it certainly can be done sure, but you have to really really tie things down for that yes and everybody's got to kind of play by the same rules i mean in productions in atlanta tyler perry has a big campus there and people lived on it and shot right. an entire thing very successfully it worked really really well a friend of mine the executive producer of a show called stranger things they built their own lab and tested people daily <laughs> because they couldn't get the turnaround and it's a very big expensive production so they just have their own pcr lab um <laughs> It's nice, it, nice if you get one. Well, maybe I'll build one at the end of my street. <laughs> you won't, by the way, you won't need it because I have another friend who's who has uh, kind of developed. They're getting approvals now from the uh, powers that be to distribute them. But they are home-based PCRs, and they cost like twenty-five bucks for the little unit, and maybe ten bucks for the card. You just swab, put it in, and it uses um, uh, light to read the uh, waves off. The uh, interesting. I don't. I don't yeah. know the technology is. Here, there's there's sort of two types of test. One which you can get at home very easily, and you can just yeah, we have some in the house. Uh, uh, and the other that you would only get if you think you might actually have COVID. Yeah, PCR tests. Bit, bit more serious. They're very accurate. Yeah, but uh, so <laughs> so t so tell us. You know, I mean, Jeremiah, I asked I asked Chris, was he excited about his workshop? Because I do I do want you know, it's important we acknowledge the challenges and important we not acknowledge people's situations, but. I was hoping that this would be a really positive conversation because I'd had you know, a positive experience. So what's your, uh, are you cautiously optimistic about your productions? Yes, uh, um, I'm, I am cautiously optimistic. I think that uh, certainly have planned it in a way that should they, they all move forward on the right level and God knows they could blow up at any time as most <laughs> Most Hollywood productions are tight ropes, but uh, it's moving in the right direction. Um, I, th I think that everyone's excited about the possibility of really kind of getting in there and doing what they have done skill wise. It will be very interesting. And this kind of brings us back to the future of photography, which is how does this year and a half of sequestering and all of the input, because we've had a lot of input and less output, you know, relatively. Um, how does that affect my technique? How does that affect my eye? How does that affect my aesthetic? How does that affect my interaction, my abilities to appreciate other people's work, to edit my own? These will have changed. Uh, they will have changed, I believe, significantly. And so I'm very interested in the before times work and the after times work and having survived, which we feel we've survived one of the most brutal pandemics in history, at least our own life. Um, and, and, and I think it's given us uh, an appreciation of life, friendship, what we had, what we, what we've lost. Um, I've lost friends from COVID. Um, there, there, there's a, there's a bittersweet aspect to it, an emotional aspect to it, that I think when we go out, that emotion is an overwhelming sense of, of, of energy that applies to our creative life. And I think that will be a very interesting discovery for all of us, no, no matter what we do, if you're a watercolor painter or if you're a snap shooter or if you're a serious kind of photographic artist. All of these things will never be or look the same. It, it just won't because our emotional makeup will be different. I, I can looking... totally relate to all of that. Um, uh, two things just from my one photo walk so far. One is uh, I forgotten most of what I ever thought I knew about photography. I was incredibly <laughs> rusty. And, and the other thing is I was just so excited to be out with people. I took maybe about 16 photos all day. <laughs> 
<laughs> Although to be fair, I was shooting medium format film, so I didn't have that much to burn anyway. But isn't that, but isn't the, that the, the, the thing of photo walks anyway that you that you end up talking more than shooting? Oh yeah, it, it is for me because I, I I can't do talking and photography at the same time. Those those are very different mental disciplines for me. So you know, when I'm at a photo walk, it's it's about the socializing as much as you know, way more than it is about the photography. Uh, to, Can I ask to, to get in the zone for photography, I need to be in either a very small group or ideally on my own for that sort of thing. Can, can, can I ask both of you uh, a question about my process? And both of you uh, do a lot of what I would consider socialized photography experiences. Mm -hmm. I've never done that. I've never had the opportunity, though. Now I wish I would go to Bhutan with both of you. <laughs> <laughs> and walk the mountains because that seems very familiar. And but you know, you know, I've traveled a lot and and will continue to do so. But my own photographic process, I get very uncomfortable, just instinctively. It's not something that I think about when people are watching me take pictures. Now, I I say this now, you know, being on the street, etc. When I was a commercial photographer and doing fashion and always working with a crew outside, and as a director, I'm very used to working under a microscope in a city with crowds around and people yelling, and <laughs> you know, that kind of chaos, especially if you're working on a show that's very, very popular in the, you know, center of New York City. You know, you're getting it from all sides. And it's fun because you're as much performing yourself as you are taking pictures <clears throat> you're performing for your actors or your models in, in case of fashion or but when i'm on my own walks photographically i feel very self-conscious when there's somebody else walking by as i'm taking a picture i i don't i, I like it to be a very private um experience and and i i don't know if that's something that is because it's personal not commercial um basically you have to pay me to perform <laughs> or if it's just, <laughs> or or if it's just a a, a kind of a, such a private uh moment of understanding a particular reality or trying to absorb something or demonstrate something or capture something that I feel the intrusion of other energies is, is yes, that's, an, that's an interesting one. I think for, for me, my, my equivalent of, of that discomfort is perhaps in a city um, pointing a camera at somebody. So at somebody, yeah, at somebody's mm. face. You know, so so the, the sort of in-your-face street photography style I would find incredibly difficult and uncomfortable. Um, but other than that, no, I, 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 it doesn't particularly worry me. Um, I don't I don't tend to get uncomfortable if people are looking at me taking a photograph, um, regardless of whether it's just like a, a very quick snapshot on a phone or whether it's something a bit more you know, thought thoughtful and, and slower. <laughs> you process. don't but, feel that you have to explain why you're shooting that flower. Um, well, maybe. No, maybe it's a, I don't. I may, don't. Maybe it's a it's, maybe it's an American thing because you you. I, I know just just from people telling me that there's there's a bit of a likelihood that you might be stopped and be asked why you're shooting and what you're shooting and what for and so or on. shot <laughs> or be yeah, shot I no mean, not happens, necessarily so. not necessarily but, no, that, but that does happen Chris that 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 does happen but generally it's usually engaged in a very positive thing where somebody says oh, what so, are you shooting here what are you doing so so for me like here. I'm I'm also kind of used to being watched, especially when I when I do this in a uh, when I do photography in a workshop context. I expect people to watch me. I want them to watch me. I want them to see it's what I do, how I though. do it. It is it is um, uh, it is performative. It's also just uh, it's a it's a it's a teaching thing, of course. Um, it's also puts I also put myself under a certain pressure there because of course. People will want to see what I shot, and it better be good. <laughs> so there's that aspect of it. Um, when I'm just out there shooting, well, it kind of really depends on what I shoot and how I shoot. Because, of course, if I set up a 4x5 camera somewhere Definitely. on a tripod, sure. then people will approach me and ask what I'm doing. And uh, look, yeah. are, they still, are they still making film for that? And there's these kind of questions. Um, sure. Whereas with um, just a 
an SLR, or DSLR, whatever. Um, no, I don't really feel watched. I don't think. I th I think that is one of the positive things about the iPhone as a tool because everyone has one it's true. and everyone's shooting everything. Um, and when you have a phone um, and you're in a kind of a, let's call it a dodgy area uh, of the world, um, taking pictures is, it's just so invisible because nobody's going to really pay that much attention to somebody snapping something on an yeah. iPhone where hauling out a big, you know, long lens and a, you know, SLR or a DSLR. Yeah, um, I think it, that, that's, that's, that's true. I, I get that, certainly. Um, the other thing I prefer to do is to have equipment with me that is not valuable. So if I'm in a if I'm in a city or something like that, you know, and I'm out and about, um, I I gain a bit more comfort by well, it's you know, it's it, it's an old camera, it's not valuable, you know, therefore I'm I'm less of a target perhaps. The other thing is is you can always disguise yourself as a tourist, which is something I do unashamedly. So you know, my photo walk I was out on it was a very hot sunny day, so I wore my straw cowboy hat and but a pair a and a pair of dark <laughs> and a pair of dark shades, you know, and and you know I I played the tourist and and so you know you can say oh, people people look at you and if you know if you have you know a whole bunch of kit with you and stuff like that then you know and you look very serious and professional then people will take more notice of you. If you, you have to like hang the tourist, camera around your neck on a thin leather strap that uh, oh, I can't completes do that. the picture that, just that completes the picture too. that keep just a hurts map, too keep much. a map in your back pocket yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah exactly that exactly that you can um mm. you know it's a it's it's a disguise Nobody so can see back. nobody can see you when you're wearing a ludicrous hat. It's a fact. And you have to wear a mask at the same time so people stay away from that's you automatically. It. You know. Um, yeah, or just sneeze so occasionally. He, if you can sneeze occasionally, that's really helpful as well. <laughs> so here's the question. How how has this pandemic or how do you feel this pandemic has affected your approach on the technical end, i.e. editing or printing uh, or just screen visualization and capture and your relationship with your equipment how has that changed for That's me good not much not much to be honest i've uh, all the photography i've done during the pandemic and now towards what feels like the end of it um no it's just still the same natural feeling picking up a camera looking through it uh, composing a frame <laughs> framing things Mm. Uh, I made a challenge to myself, which was at the beginning, I've been using Photoshop since Photoshop one, first one. And I thought, you know, and, and like many or most Photoshop users, you use intensely maybe 25% of Photoshop and then the rest is like, well, sure. I'll use it for that. I decided that I would teach myself every tool in wow. Photoshop. Oh, that's Maybe a lot. Maybe not to use it like... Ex <laughs> oh, I'm not done yet. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm not done. But but literally going through every tool and understanding what it does or what it could do uh, has been fantastic. And it's really deepened my appreciation, not only for editing in Photoshop, but in terms of how to manage layers in a whole different way, how to apply different kinds of editing tools and combine them and... Um, how to achieve parts of a look that may be more off the shelf and adjusting them uh, to get what it is that I want and also embracing surprise. Mm. That's, that's really interesting to, to learn. I mean, I, I think I have something similar in, in the sense that you know, the, the balance of all the, the, the breadth of photo photographic activities, I cer certainly been doing more in you know, in the house, you know, the post production type stuff, rather than going out and taking photos. I think, but I think that'd probably be the same for everybody. I've been teaching myself a bit more about color and certainly around uh, color grading of, of video as well. So trying to trying to learn some new techniques. Um, I, I think in terms of has it ch or how it has changed how I take or make photo photographs. Um, that's a really good, that's a really good segue to my pick of the week. So I don't know if we're ready to. I don't know if we're ready to wind up this Absolutely. show just, yet. Just one last thing for me, because it just it just appeared, uh, of course, um, that the thing that I have been 
doing in terms of photography that really changed is that, um, well, if you're watching YouTube, you can see the result of that. Um, yeah, good point. I, I included, I included the whole... Your hat. No, not really. There's hair <laughs> under it. It's just in the way. Um, no, Stevie no. Ray Vaughan. No, it's more, like, it's more like a little Stephen impression that I'm doing here. Oh, oh there you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's, it's really, um, it has really changed my, my whole um, look at photography in a, on a, in a moving sense because um, mm -hmm. the whole live production thing um, is, was a big learning experience. So that's at least one good thing. So let's go to the mm. picks of the week, Adrian. What's sure. your pick of the week? Okay, well, my, my pick of the week is, as I say, it was a really good segue into this. So um, it's something that I've been doing uh, a, a lot more of since the weather got better here. But um, one of the things that I do now, which I never did before, um, is that I, I have little photography mini breaks in between all my video calls and, and other bits of work. You know, I'll quite you know, very happily get up at, you know, move away from my desk, pick up a camera and just simply go out in the garden and just even if it's just a very simple uh, taking a photograph of a flower in the garden. Um, yeah, that's that's something that I do now and quite a lot and um, uh, close up photography because there's only so much so many shots you can take of your own garden or, or, or backyard, isn't it? Yeah, but so I've been looking for things that are, um, you know, to, to do close up stuff, not not proper macro photography. Um, you know that not not, not uh, and not in a technical sense either more in a more in a let's get let's take a, a mental break from from the work that I'm doing kind of a sense um so it's just you know pottering around you know pointing the camera at a flower getting right close you know maybe you know certainly le less than an inch away from something or something like that and taking a little close up shot sometimes some abstract stuff just for patterns or or patterns of light or textures and stuff like that so there is a, there is a difference there and i just wanted to cuz again this is the connected to this week's theme because i wanted to be positive i find that very therapeutic so you know it, it it's it's not quite getting back out there, but it is it is a chance for me to to feel better because I get to take photographs. And and to that point, I I'm still waiting for Don Camaraccio's book to arrive. Oh, I got mine. I got mine. I'm not I'm not Thinking doing anything that that like that. That would carry me through the pandemic. Well, with uh, macro, I'm excited about seeing it finally. That's an amazing uh, book. And it's heavy. Oh my God! He puts so much stuff in there. I'm waiting. Well, <laughs> I'm waiting. I think I think I must have been one of his first backers. So I got I, I got I'm, first I'm dibs, sure. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, my pick of the week is a video on YouTube by a channel called Smarter Every Day. So all the nerds out there should know Destin and his uh, show where he explains things. And uh, one of the things that he recently explained was film. And uh, the title of the video is "How Does Film Actually Work." And then it says it's magic. So he's he's the <laughs> science guy usually. He explains things in a very scientific way, and um, and uh, he brings the fil whole film thing to this conclusion of it is magic. There is something about film <laughs> that is really hard to explain. And he does go to a lab, and in the lab, and well, he first explains how it works he, he, down to down to the microscopic level. Like he takes a negative and puts it in a microscope and looks at the different silver grains, and and then he ends up in a in a uh, independent uh, film lab, and they explain how this whole development process works. And um, the the fun thing where I went. Oh, 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 I know this, I know this, was when they showed him their development machine, which is um, a big processor, which is a, a big old clunky machine with wheels and chains and things, and the film gets dunked into basins and then stays in there and then gets lifted up again and dunked into the next one. Everything happens in the dark. And um, there's this f company, I believe in Belgium, who used to build them and the film photography workshops that I used to hold with a friend in Berlin and in his lab, he had one of these machines. So they imported them uh, to the United States, got them uh, in working condition again, so they can pretty much uh, put film in there. And uh, it, it's just, it's, it's a very good episode of Smarter Every Day. And I can only recommend you watch this if you're even just a little bit interested in how this works. Cool. So, 
Jeremiah. I, I uh, chose something rather oblique just because I, I, I stumbled upon it. And I, I'm heart, you know, I hearken back to Sugimoto's portraits in wax museums. But these photos are absolutely spectacular. Uh, uh, how they were done, the actual subjects. It, it, it is a portrait of style and time. They're consistent, but they are, they're amazing. I, I just think they, for those of, of you who are listening, these are photos of mannequins from the 20s, um, and they are so beautifully um, photographed and, and sculpted um, and lit um, and probably printed that I just thought, well, this is worth looking at again. And what a collection. What a collection. I know. Right. They're all completely different from each other as well, aren't they? It's quite, yeah, they quite are astonishing. so yeah. good. So good. I'm extraordinarily impressed by this. Very artsy. I mean, they really... Very, like, very. Like, but, but also kind of very realistic, but then on the other hand... Very stylized at the same time. De de <laughs> very strange, very weird. It's the uncanny valley of the 1920s. Yes, exactly. Probably right. true. Uh, maybe, maybe that's why I'm attracted to them. What a collection. That is amazing. What anyway, I encourage everybody to go on our show notes and track this down because it is. Um, you don't see these kind of images every day. Absolutely. Yeah. Interesting stuff. So, I guess that kind of gets us to the end of this episode um yeah i'm all i can say is uh, everyone if you have the chance to meet people and do photography together maybe on a photo walk or maybe on some other event of toe. sorts dip Take your a toe. shot dip your toe um try it out if you're if you're safe <laughs> keep that in mind but yep, stay 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 safe but i keep like, a mask around or maybe two and double them up <laughs> and uh <laughs> Keep keep that keep that keep that hand sanitizer in reach. But it is possible, and it can be a very positive experience. All right, we'll be back in a week from now, and uh, until then, everyone, take care and bye bye. Bye. You've been listening to the future of photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Hold up. 